Thank you very much. I never get a band to introduce me. Um, there was a recent uh, quote by Jason Silver that tried to redefine what a billionaire was, and I thought after uh, yesterday and today, I thought, and especially just now with, with that last presentation, uh, the redefinition of a billionaire is someone that can touch the lives of a billion people. Uh, and I think things like that movie and that work have the potential to touch a billion people. So I think you know, maybe next year we can think of uh, things that really do touch a billion people. So thank you very much for inviting me here. My name is Mark Kleitauer. I work at Novartis. Um, my connection to digital uh, is that I'm the head of digital solutions at Novartis. Um, we talked about the Internet of Things um, and how many things are going to be connected in the future. Um, we work on respiratory. I, I work in respiratory. And so even the inhalers in the future are going to be connected. So the things, the, the little blue inhalers uh, that you have for asthma or things that we work in in COPD, which is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which I'll talk a, bit, a little bit about later on, uh, or things like cystic fibrosis. But I'm not really here to talk about that today. Um, I'm here to follow on from that wonderful presentation and talk about patience and storytelling. Storytelling, I think, has been uh, used an awful lot to... Uh, change the way that we think about the world and to bring us very present into what people are thinking. But it's not really done in healthcare. People don't think in story terms uh, in healthcare. So I wanted to start with Susan Sontag. She's a writer. She was a writer. She's, she's died now. Uh, she's a filmmaker. And uh, she wrote a, a book, and she had a famous quote that she said, uh, we're all born with two passports. I have got two passports, you can ask me why later on. Uh, we're all born with two passports, one for the kingdom of the well and the other one for the kingdom of the sick. And whilst we choose to use the first passport most of the time, we're all obliged to at least recognize that we have the other passport and we spend some time in illness. And so that's what I want to talk about, about wellness and illness and how digital life comes together and how we understand uh, the life of people with diseases rather than patients and talk about, um, talk about their stories. Interestingly, Susan Sontag also wrote in her book Illness as a, uh, as a Metaphor. Um, she also wrote that metaphor and symbolic language has no place in the description of science and, and illness. And that's something that I want to change over the, the next coming minutes because I think it does. But I'm... Uh, implicit in this. And uh, I grew up um, in England. I live in France. I work in Switzerland. I cross the border every day. Um, but predominantly, I'm a scientist. I, I'm, I'm a chemist. Uh, but let me take you back to when I, was, when I was six. When I was six in the playground, uh, everyone wanted to be Captain uh, Kirk out of Star Trek. Uh, but I wanted to be Spock. That's where I recognize. So we can see how many other people can do live long and prosper. There you go. <laughs> so we have lots of people that can do live long and prosper. Unfortunately, Leonard Nimoy died earlier this year of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So I feel very connected to him. He was an inspiration, uh, the, the movie, the, the, the films, uh, the character was an inspiration for me to live a life in science. So as I grew up in the middle of England, uh, I became a scientist. Uh, I went to university, and I came away with a, with a PhD in organic synthetic chemistry, making the molecules that we work in medicine, uh, make things that plants create and we use. So I became a scientist probably because of Spock. But during that process, I trained my brain. I think there's a presentation later about training your brain. I trained my brain to think logically, like Spock, expunge all of the emotion take the emotion away, and think logically and rationally. But as you spend your life in science thinking about molecules, carbon, hydrogen, and all of the complexity of life, there are a couple of things as I grew up into working life and I started to interact with people and started to present to people, started to present ideas, to talk about innovation, to talk about different things. Things weren't sticky. My ideas, other people's ideas, they 
were present for a moment and then they slid away. They didn't stick with people. And I think my conclusion uh, is that we miss something. So how many scientists and engineers do we have in the room? So you hand up. So you've got quite a few. So you're all now in charge of Project Sushi. But there's been an emergency uh, because the board has come together and said, we don't like what you've done. Uh, because you've described this as cold, raw, dead fish. And that's the logical, rational, but without the emotion behind it. And I think that's what science is sometimes uh, responsible for. We understand it, but it doesn't move us. So what I want to talk about is why we change and why we don't change. The behavior of people with diseases, why they change, why they follow medical advice, and why they don't follow medical advice, and maybe some things that as you create digital solutions in healthcare, you think about changing healthcare from a digital way, how that might need to be part of your creation. So all that we're trying to do here is make science memorable. This is equally applicable for, uh, for pharmaceuticals, it's applicable for physicians, for healthcare, uh, it's applicable for agrochemicals or science. What makes science memorable? How do you remember how do you retain things? How do you transmit things that people will, will retain? But before we get there, um, as was said in the introduction, I think, and you, you heard yesterday, that healthcare is under a uh, disruption and under a change. And I think there are three key trends that underlie that. I think there is a big move and a recognition, and even in the last sentence, to move away from sick care from providing solutions that are just there at the time when people get sick, to winding that back to help people live in wellness and manage illness inside wellness. And I think that's a key part. If we're going to do that, then digital really has a role uh, because we need actionable biomedical information. We need to provide understanding of the wellness of people before they get sick so that we can intervene and we can work uh, with them, we can get to the right place at the right time for them. Because precision medicine means not just medicine that's personalized for you, it means the right time uh, to turn it on, to turn it off, and to get the right thing. And it's not just medicine, it's the right environment, uh, the right digital tools, the right patient solutions that go around, the holistic side of medicine that can come back, not the technician side. When we get all of those things right, there are four Ps, I think, that change healthcare. Again, that I think people in this room are already working on. If we can prevent certain diseases, not all diseases are preventable, but if we can prevent them, then that's something that's obviously really good. But even if we can't do that, maybe that we can predict events. Big data, algorithms, understanding people's wellness and journeys into illness can be understood and we can start to predict and say, in the future it may be like this, 23andMe, start to look at the genomics, there are lots of sensor companies that can start to understand whether you're going to have a heart attack or whether you're going to be likely for a fall or cognition's changing, some of those things we talked about yesterday. And eventually you get to precision prescription, so the right drug that's right for you. Whether we ever get to the point of having an individual drug exactly for you for all of your diseases, I don't know. But at least we can find the right drug for you that has the best effect. So the crux of my presentation is about patient-led design. It's about bringing the patient into the front of design of healthcare. Uh, and I think whether you're creating apps for patients, whether you're creating uh, technical uh, pieces of sensors or mobile or wearables or pharmaceuticals or even education, games, as well. Looking to patients and how patients would see those, I think, is, the, is the, the key part. Because when we get there, when you do it from the other way around, when you really understand what patients are living, people with diseases are living, you really do get to design better products. And of course, that's great for everyone. Um, you get better outcomes. And by outcomes, we mean healthcare outcomes. Adherence is uh, one of those things. That means, do I do the things that 
I'm supposed to do with, with healthcare. And no one in this room is 100% adherent or 100% compliant to the medicines that they take. Behavior tells us that only 40% of the, the time that you take medical advice, uh, you will do it as directed. And many of that is because it's, it's, some of it's not possible. Some of it's practically not possible for people to do. We can engineer around that. But there's another part where we understand that from adherence, that there are two psychological pieces, perceptual pieces that are going. One is that people uh, have a higher concern for taking the medication and a low need. And if those needs, concerns, ratios are out of, out of kilter, then people don't follow medical advice. This costs the world uh, billions of dollars a year in wrong medication, lost medication, or lo um, lower outcomes. So, of course, if we can change that, that would be lower cost. Let me tell you a quick story, then, of um, story. So, uh, it's September the 11th, in the um, South Tower, uh, a lady called uh, Melissa looked at and saw the explosion in the North Tower. She stopped for a minute. There was actually a lot of confusion going on around at that time. But at that stage, she decided to move down into the elevator and walk away. One of her friends went with her, but a couple of minutes later, going down the stairs, turned back and said, I've got to go and get my baby pictures. And Melissa said, don't be silly. Come out with me. But she went back. And of course, Melissa walked out. Um, and she did get out. Uh, she was one of the lucky ones. And the others uh, didn't get out. It was just the time was lost. So I think what that tells you is that there's a central story that's very difficult for us to move away from. What's inside us and what's directing us is very diff difficult to uh, work with. Change, our change is very difficult. So patient stories. I listen to thousands of hours of patients. My part of this is listening to patient stories. So I listen to the dialogue between patients and physicians, patients and their carers, patients and their loved ones, and try and understand what's going on. I try and listen to several different pieces. The thing I'm most interested in is listening to metaphors. I'm interested in listening to the way that people tell their own story. Metaphors, for me, are the smallest part of a story that you can get. It's the way that I tell you something. We're relational beings. It's the way I tell you something that comes from me to you, and you get the understanding. You create the understanding for yourself. It's a great way for us to, to do that. When we hear metaphors, in something like COPD, we hear metaphors. Uh, energy is the currency of COPD. That means that I need to understand that um, if I'm going to save energy um, or I'm going to do things later, I'm really thinking about the way I spend my time and how I use my energy. And that helps us design things. It helps us design education. It helps us design products. It helps us design um, all sorts of things. When we really understand what's going on in terms of patients, what they're saying and what they're not saying. Uh, another conversation between a physician and a patient was talking about the tightrope that both of them walked on. Uh, as they got towards living with COPD, and any change, any sudden change, could knock them both off this tightrope. So change for people uh, is uh, needed to be understood about how you can use that. So metaphors, for me, really help me understand and help me retell stories back to our internal teams. It helps me tell stories to product designers. It helps me tell stories to to the academic world and the physician's world. Things that make that things stick in people's mind, things that make people remember and hopefully uh, lead change. Archetypes are a different type. They help us look at the narrative of patients. They help us look at the journey. It's very difficult to be in uh, Switzerland without looking at Carl Jung and looking at Joseph Campbell and looking at archetype work and looking at the common stories that people tell, the commonalities, the things that are kind of inbuilt in our own inner library. And we can use those to help people understand where people are and where they're going uh, because they're, they're, they're inbuilt inside. So you can see, this is not the scientist that, that I once was. This is very much 
pulling humanities into science and trying to work through those. Um, the narrative uh, that we usually use in, uh, in healthcare is putting people back to a normal narrative. It's pulling people back to what we think is the normal narrative. Now, in acute care, where you break your leg, uh, you end up in a hospital, and of course, uh, over a short period of time, you're back to your normal life. But chronic care, chronic management, is very different. Your normal narrative has gone. Your narrative has changed. And it's our objective to help try and find the, the new normal narrative. It's not the narrative of a normal person. It's changed, because you're going to live with a chronic disease your life. But it's not necessarily the same narrative that the patient has. So it's very much to find out from their story in and help use that story for, for design. So the, the last couple of slides on, on digital. How can digital help? Uh, we've seen a lot about mobile phones. This is my first mobile phone. Luckily, they've all changed. Now we can do lots of things with mobile phones that we never even thought that they actually did. Uh, mobile phones are great, um, and they have come a long way. Uh, but when we think about patient-led design, patient-led design is not necessarily about uh, wearables. We have to think about the elderly. Yes, they'll all have phones, but they use phones in very different ways, as I've seen. Apps, the first app was the Lightsaber uh, app. That was the, the, the biggest app when the App Store launched. Uh, now we can do augmented reality surgery, a bit like uh, the cards. So fantastic things we can do with apps. But again, apps need to be designed from the patient backwards rather than the other way around. If you look at apps that are developed in healthcare these days, there's a very different way of dialogue. They're developed from developers to patients, not patients to developers. Wearables, um, I think, are an explosion of um, healthcare. We'll provide billions of bits of data, but we also have to recognize on how they will change behavior and how we augment around those. So finally then, um, in my patient-led design, what I, uh, what I look to is the way that uh, metaphor, archetypes, and patient-led design can change the life of this person. If this person grows up in a new world, this person will grow up in a very different healthcare wellness world and live with one passport in wellness and hopefully when he does need to cross the border into illness we can push him back very quickly back into into healthcare thank you very much